AD on the radio. So, there's some interesting stuff in the news today with regard to um, with regard to 9/11, and I don't know I don't know what the significance of 9/11 is to you, but I'd sort of made a decision at least on this show because we weren't on the air. We're off Fridays, and 9/11 fell on a Friday. I'd sort of made a decision to kind of leave that one alone at least on this show. I did it on my other radio shows where I was on the air, and I talked a little bit about 9-11 and and where we were at with it, I suppose. But it sort of came screaming back into the news today. Sort of came screaming back into the news today with uh, just a couple of... uh, We'll we'll get to it later on in in the show. But bearing in mind that we're going to be talking about it, in this particular instance of the show, because a couple of things happened after the fact. I feel like I'd be kind of remiss not to, not to maybe share with you a little bit the uh, the current state of affairs <laughs> in my mind with 9-11. Because it was, it was 14 years ago, almost to the day, that I woke up in my home in New York City. I wasn't still a boy, But also, I was definitely not yet a man. And looking out my window, looking out my window, I saw two plumes of smoke where the twin towers of the World Trade Center once stood. And I did a lot of growing up very quickly. The terrorist attack that claimed the lives of nearly 3,000 people brought untold amounts of grief and suffering and fear and anger, not only to people like me living in New York City at the time, but also to the rest of the nation. And, well, yeah, the rest of the world is felt on a global scale. And we will never forget. But this past Friday just gone by, even as I mourned those that we lost, as I have done every year for the last 14 years, whether I want to or not, it's not out of a sense of reverence or duty or responsibility. It's just inescapable, I think for those that were living in New York City at the time. But even as I mourned those that we lost, I felt like, I felt like I'm ready now. I felt like I'm ready now, I think, to take some of this grief and some of this suffering and some of this anger. Some of it. But honor the memories of those that we lost that day by finding a way to win. By finding a way to win. How? Through love. Win through love of our country. And love of our fellow man. So what I did on September 11th, and what ask, what I would ask you to do on September 11th that fall after this, is obviously never, never forget. But also, if you can find it in your heart, if you can find it in your heart, Seek out a way to show love, to show appreciation to everything, to all that's good around you. Maybe a small gesture of kindness. Maybe performing a good deed or helping a friend or a relative or a neighbor or volunteering some of your time. Giving up some of that most precious commodity, your time. And remember and honor those that we lost by doing something positive so that they did not die in vain, but instead serve as an inspiration in our lifetimes. And during September 11th, there's always one quote that I'm drawn to, because I remember it. I remember it coming from the man who was my mayor in New York City at the time. And... It's a poignant quote made more poignant by the passage of time in that I felt as though I felt as though these words really summed up where we were at. Not only 
as New Yorkers, not only as Americans, but as humanity. And it was an ironic state of affairs that such positivity came out of something that was so terrible that caused so much grief. And I look at where we're at today, a country that is more divided than I ever remember it being in my lifetime. People people placing less and less value, it seems, on other human lives. And I'm not talking about a racial or societal divide, just in general. Lives, and I'm not talking about ending lives, I'm just saying considering other people's lives, considering that everybody has a life, everybody is struggling with something that you know nothing about, so treat them with kindness. Let that be your default. I feel like we've moved further and further away from that, and we're the furthest from it that I remember being in my lifetime. But I feel like this quote from my mayor at the time, Rudy Giuliani, sums up exactly where we should be right now, and sadly we're not. The attacks of September 11th were intended to break our spirit, Instead, we have emerged stronger and more unified. We feel renewed devotion to the principles of political, economic, and religious freedom, the rule of law, and respect for human life. We are more determined than ever to live our lives in freedom. Rudolph Giuliani, December 31st, 2001. iHeartRadio puts the spotlight on Green Day. After some time off, Green Day made a major comeback with 2004's rock opera, American Idiot. The album sold over 6 million copies and was adapted into a Broadway musical. Their next studio album, 2009's 21st Century Breakdown, was also a rock opera and hit number one in the U.S., Europe, and the U.K., making it Green Day's best charting album. At the end of 2012, Green Day released a trilogy of albums, Uno, Dose, and Trey, marking the official addition of Jason White to the band after touring with him since 1999. However, the third album's release was delayed due to Armstrong entering rehab for alcohol and prescription medication. When Armstrong completed rehab, the band toured throughout 2013 to support the three albums. They also released a compilation of demos from Uno, Dose, and Trey in 2014 under the title Demolicious. All things Green Day, info, music, and more are on iHeartRadio, keyword Green Day. iHeartRadio goes one-on-one with Mike Rutherford to discuss that even though there were generational difficulties, his father was always quite supportive. You know, you've got to understand, I'm sure it's the same over here, but in, in the UK, in England, you know, that, that generational change from my father's era to my era, you know, he was the English Empire days, two world wars. It was, it was hard to communicate. There was a big divide between us. It's just there was no dialogue, really. You couldn't discuss things because there was no sort of platform to, to share conversations on. But no, he was supportive. And in a way, you know, given that he hadn't got a clue what I was doing, you know, in those, <laughs> in the, in the, who did what parent did in those days, you know, music, long hair and a guitar. Um, he was, given that, he was very supportive. Keep listening to iHeartRadio for more Mike Rutherford and all your favorite artists. Like most kids from a privileged white upper-middle-class suburban background, for a significant portion of his childhood, he was pretty convinced he was down. AD, on the radio. So a couple of 9-11-esque things happened over the last couple of days, post 9-11. And uh, like we said earlier in the show, I kind of didn't want to belabor that particular point. Did that on my other shows in this past week just gone by. And, well, we didn't have a show on 9-11. And, you know, I would talk about about 9-11 and the stories and the human cost and the 
rise in humanity that we felt post 9-11 and the rise of camaraderie and compassion toward our fellow man that we felt post 9-11 till I'm blue in the face because it is perhaps the most relevant example of tragedy and humanity that has happened in my lifetime that directly affected all of us. But you know what? People are kind of fatigued with it, which is sad, but it just happens. People are kind of fatigued with it, so I didn't want to drone on and on about it. But something something kind of interesting happened with regard... Well, a couple of interesting things happened with regard to 9-11. Specifically, uh, that... Uh, Funkhauser, do you know who Adrian Grenier is? Uh, dude from Entourage? The swarthy-looking one, right? Ah, uh, one of them. I think. I don't know. Some 90s actor from Entourage, uh, caught a lot of heat for something that he tweeted out or Instagrammed out on 9-11. And then Jerry Casals, do you know who that is? Jerry Casal? No, uh-uh. He's he's one of the founding members of Devo. Oh, he, uh, wow, flower he's, hat guy. He's taking some, yeah, yeah, he's, he's taking some 9-11 heat in a really weird way, and we'll get into all that after we get into the events of today in our segment, My Witness News and No Way Shape or Fair, certainly not balanced. Funkhauser, A, how are you? B, what is going on in the world? You know, man, the world the world changes every day. <laughs> and today the world is different. Why? Because it's Why? raining. Mm-mm. It has not rained in mm, three months, I think. We've had a heat mm. wave of suck. Uh-huh. And now water's falling from the sky and things are flooded and people don't know what to do. My, my brother-in-law uh, moved to Los Angeles not so long ago. And he felt a drop of rain on his head. With the uh, the start of the uh, <laughs> the three raindrop monsoon that's been happening in mm-hmm. Southern California, and um, he was so unaccustomed to rain, he uh, when he got hit by a drop of rain on his head, he looked up. He was like, "Oh, it's leaking," and he was like, "Oh, wait, no, that's rain." What is this water uh, falling from the sky? Yeah, uh, uh, precipitation. I've heard about this. Well, there's two things that happen when it rains for the first time in a long time, right? All the oil comes up, and everybody's slip sliding to work and back. Yeah, and uh, also none of the drains work, so it's a yeah. it's a party time for the pedestrians. Yeah, no, and you know, God love them. People in California cannot drive in any sort of precipitation. I, I talk to this. Um, I <laughs> talk about this. Actually, uh, there there's a guy that uh, used to work at Real Radio 104.1 in Orlando, oh, Florida, so where we're ready. on now. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm yeah, so yeah. not ready. Oh gosh, it's okay. okay <laughs> Let's try this again, Funkhauser. Are you ready now? Okay, I'm There's ready. a guy that used to work at Real Radio 104.1 in Orlando. 104.1. And uh, in Florida, it rains all the time. But for short amounts of time, and incredibly heavily, in a hurricane-esque sort of fashion, in a monsoon-esque sort of fashion that causes roads to flood, and it's just old news to the Floridians, and it's crazy. But in California... Uh, this guy that worked at Real Radio 104.1 in Orlando Radio. moved to California. Radio. 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 104.1. Guy called Jonathan Howell, and he was in the early days of this show one of the producers on it. And I remember talking to him about it. He'd be like, "It rained like two drops, and people in California absolutely lost their s." We like them, but they are completely unable to cope with any sort of precipitation. It, it's like in Texas. It's like in Texas when it snows, even just a little bit. Like, I had, uh, I, I remember I had a gig once in Texas where I had to go, I had to go stand outside some car dealership. And it was, it was part of Monster Jam, that whole thing, the monster trucks. And Gravedigger, Gravedigger from Monster Jam was out there with me at this event. And so what I was supposed to do was I was supposed to encourage people, hey, come out, meet me in Gravedigger. Take a test drive of a car, get free Monster Jam tickets. That's all you got to do. And, you know, Gravedigger in and of himself is quite the draw. But it was like the one day of the year in Texas where it was snowing. So there was like literally nobody there. Like, because li- Texans and snow, mm, no, it like <laughs> these big guys in their enormous trucks w- with gun racks mounted on the back, the, uh, on the back, the, these, these bastions of pure American red blooded testosterone. Uh, two flakes of snow and they're like oh god get quick take cover get inside and um so i like i posted up on the radio station facebook page i was like hey come come meet me and grave digger at this car dealership and test drive a car and get and people lost their minds on me people lost their minds on me like 
how could you tell us to drive out in this mess? And I was like, mess? I've seen a flake of snow and that was three hours ago. How could you how could you tell us to come out here in this mess and then encourage us to take another test drive? Child killer, child killer. And it was like, oh, my God, people. And it just speaks to the fact child that killer. In certain, no, seriously, in, in, in parts of the country, when it comes to different types of precipitation, whether it be rain in California or two flakes of snow in, in Texas. Some people just lose their ever-loving minds in, in Texas, especially. I was like, really? I, I saw three flakes three hours ago. That that was it. <laughs> the blizzard of 13. Okay. All right. Now we can move on with our lives. But it, it's a little nutty how people can't take certain weather conditions in certain places and how, how much it takes you out of your comfort zone. All right. What's going on in the world, Funk? Arnold Schwarzenegger will replace Donald Trump as the host of Celebrity Apprentice on NBC. <laughs> uh, he's already making changes. You're fired is out, and now it's get to the chopper. Can, can you do a Schwarzenegger? Get down. No, I, I can't. Can you I say get to I the chopper? Get to the chopper. That's not bad. Uh, that's pretty good. Ah. Uh, <laughs> judging by Schwarzenegger's history as an employer, I think either he's going to fire the contestants or get them pregnant. <laughs> or both. Uh, or both, yeah. Uh, anyways, bottom line is I think Celebrity Apprentice will not have subtitles. What else? A former Colorado radio DJ is suing Taylor Swift after he was fired for allegedly grabbing her rear end. Yeah. Allegedly. Allegedly. Kanye West interrupted the lawsuit to say that Beyonce has the most squeezable, <laughs> squeezable butt of all time. Of all time. Um, did, you, did you read this story? Did you hear about this? No, but I mean, what a great way to get fired. Well, so he says he didn't do it, though. Uh, and... Um, uh, where it, it's and it was after it, those it, it wacky was back DJs are always lying to us. It, it was back in 2013. He was fired after the meet and greet with Taylor Swift. She accused him of grabbing her bottom, quote unquote, <laughs> her bottom, her bottom. Well, it says bottom in the uh, in the lawsuit. Um, the incident happened back in 2013. When this guy got, he went, anybody that listens in Colorado know this guy? Uh, he went under the name Jackson. And he and his girlfriend, uh, oh, what now? Bo Jackson? No, no, not Bo Jackson, okay. just Jackson. But he and his girlfriend, who, who was his co-worker, chick called Shannon Melcher, they attended this meet and greet with Taylor Swift for work. They joined her for a photo, after which Swift allegedly complained to her security team that he had, quote, lifted her skirt with his hands and grabbed her bottom. And uh, that's pretty specific. Yeah. They were immediately removed by uh, security personnel and Mueller was fired. He denies the claim. And uh, the lawsuit, I think, says the contention that Mr. Mueller lifted up Miss Swift's skirt and grabbed her bottom while standing with his girlfriend in front of Miss Swift's photographer and Miss Swift's highly trained security personnel during a company sponsored VIP backstage meet and greet is nonsense, particularly given that Miss Swift's skirt is in place and not being lifted by Mueller's hand in the photograph. The uh, photographic evidence, sadly, unavailable to us. Mm. <laughs> uh, I was on my way um, to Google at that time when you, before you told me mm, it's not available. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's uh, seeking to recuperate his income in 2013. In 2013, he was making $150,000 a year, apparently. What kind of DJ is this guy? In, co in Colorado? I don't know. I know guys that make one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year just by being a DJ. It just, I think it involves being, another twelve in a row. Yeah, one of those guys. <laughs> twelve in a row. I, who knows? Who knows? It, it it's like the uh, uh, it, what? What's her name? No, she she works for this company. I can't say it right. <laughs> oh, the one up north, Pacific Northwest. I just okay. Takes a lot I'll of dedication it. calls. Delilah, oh. who is look? I'm not taken away from anything that she's built. I'm not taking away from the fact that she is a beloved personality. And you know what? She's paid what she's paid, which means the market supports it. Therefore, that is what she is worth. But in terms of num amount of time logged talking to make what she does, it it's pretty spectacular, the ratio of words spoken to paycheck drawn. And um, may maybe this guy had that sort of situation where he was a man of few words, but they were very weighty and important. But yeah, yeah, he, he squeezed Taylor Swift's butt allegedly. Do you think he did? Y yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, wacky DJ, sure. Lifted her skirt it depends. and squeezed yeah, the well, butt. I don't know. I don't know. Because I think but that is a the truth lies somewhere in the middle, right? 
it is it is a firing offense. I, you know what it is though. I, I wonder. I wonder if uh, it was just an inadvertent brush. It's a very Seinfeldian, Larry David esque concept. No, no lift and squeeze, just a brush. Uh, you know, like he might have had. He he might. It's Colorado. Colorado's very very cold. He might have been wearing sort of a bulky jacket with some sort of snaps on it and stuff. And you know, as you lift up your arm to put your arm around the person you're taking a picture to. You know, uh, pieces of your Velcro or, or whatever the hell it is you're wearing or your snaps or I, I don't know. I, I live mostly in Texas and California, so I don't wear bulky winter clothes. But in Colorado, you know, it, it's sort of like an extra layer of stuff that you have no control over. I, I, I'm willing to accept that something might have touched Taylor Swift's butt that she felt like was a, a lift and squeeze. Velcro motion. faux pas. Velcro faux. I, I think it might have been in its own weird way, some sort of wardrobe malfunction. But I can't imagine that a guy making 150 G's a year would jeopardize that by going, I'm going to squeeze Taylor Swift's butt. That said, if there's one common thread that runs through the psyche of most American radio personalities that I've noticed, it is a tremendous sense of self importance. And, um, Going like, I'm going to squeeze Taylor Swift's butt, and it's going to be awesome, and, and it will make me a hero in this town. Uh, that's not entirely uh, out of the realm of possibility either. So we wait and see how the lawsuit uh, falls. Tune in tomorrow but, for another wacky story. Yeah. I could never Taylor sue Swift's any of the people butt. that come through. I, I could never sue any of the people that I interview. Like, that's not going to... Yeah. I'm not going to make it... Like, he gets to interview Taylor Swift. It's just like, <laughs> what happens if I sue, like... Well, no, I guess the guy's. I just wonder what happens. Money. Like, let's let's say it works out and he doesn't get sued and everything. What uh, what's going to happen to like like how are they going to treat the radio station and like will we ever see Taylor Swift in Colorado again? You I don't know, know. Like, yeah. Are you blacklisted what? from the uh, Taylor Swift empire? Are you going to get struck by lightning? Taylor Swift seems pretty adept at, at uh, doing damage control. Yeah. So I would, I would uh, once it's all over, I, I would not be surprised surprised if she made some sort of bit out of it the way she did when write a song face, about it. Nicki Minaj went after her for you know like being white on Twitter. I don't know. I can't remember no, what it was. No, you didn't touch my out. butt. Uh huh. You didn't touch my butt. Uh-huh. Oh yes, you did. Oh yes, you did. Uh huh. It's uh-huh. <laughs> very good. <laughs> now that's gonna be stuck in my head. <laughs> you didn't touch my butt. Uh huh. Uh-huh. You didn't touch my butt. No. Uh-huh. You didn't touch my butt. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Lift and squeeze. Lift and squeeze. And squeeze. Lift and squeeze. And squeeze. And squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're gonna get sued for uh, ripping off her latest single. I think we're just gonna get sued for doing bad radio. Move on with the news, please. Uh, rap- speaking of rapper Azalea Banks. Says Donald Trump's immigration plan will help black Americans. Mm. Mm, yes, rapper Azalea Banks. Sorry. But when it comes to evaluating the complex, far reaching debate between an open border versus increased national security, I kind of never weigh in until I've heard from Wiz Khalifa, so I'm going to hold off on <laughs> submitting judgments. <laughs> what else is happening? Ben Affleck is reportedly uh-huh. hooking up with Sienna Miller. Yeah. Ben Affleck hooking up with Sienna Miller and his ex is not happy. You can see it all over Matt Damon's face. USA Headline News, I'm Tammy Rose. The manhunt ends for Delta State University instructor Shannon Lamb, who shot and killed faculty colleague Ethan Schmidt and Lamb's girlfriend Amy Prentice in what's being called a love triangle when Lamb committed suicide late Monday after vowing to police that he was not going to jail. Two female students are dead and four other people are hurt after a school bus overturned on a Houston highway. Houston Independent School District spokesperson Holly Huffman told the Houston Chronicle the first student died of her injuries while four other students and the bus driver were being rushed to the hospital. KHOU reported that the district said a second girl died later. For the latest headlines making news across the country, go to usaheadlinenews.com and give us a like on Facebook. 
You're listening to USA Headline News. Hi, I'm Jen London. When I needed to find senior care for my mom, I really struggled to find the right fit until I found an advisor, someone who had been through this before. That's why I recommend A Place for Mom, the nation's largest senior living referral service. They have experts who will help you ask the right questions and find the right place. Call A Place for Mom today. To speak with the local senior living advisor, call A Place for Mom at 1-800-469-7591. That's 1-800-469-7591. A Place for Mom has helped over 200,000 families find the right senior care for their parents, from assisted living to independent living, even Alzheimer's care, and have local advisors that can help explain your options at no cost to you. To speak with the local senior living advisor, call A Place for Mom at 1-800-469-7591. That's 1-800-469-7591. Call today. Trending. In the NFL, week one comes to a close with a Monday Night Football doubleheader. In the late game, the 49ers beat the Vikings 20-3. to San Francisco running back Carlos Hyde had 168 yards rushing and two touchdowns. Jim Tom Sula wins in his San Francisco head coaching debut. And the Falcons hold off the Eagles for a 26-24 win. Atlanta quarterback Matt Ryan had a pair of touchdown passes to wide receiver Julio Jones. Kicker Matt Bryant converted on four field goals. Dan Quinn wins in his Falcons head coaching debut. In baseball games of note, the Rangers beat the Astros 5 to three. Houston's lead on Texas is down to a half game in the AL West race. Twins top the Tigers 7-1. to one. Minnesota remains a game back of Texas in the race for the second American League wildcard spot. Yankees down the race 4-1. to one. New York is three back of Toronto in the AL East race. The Angels fall to the Mariners 10-1. to one. Angels are four out in the race for that AL wildcard spot. Four and a half back in the AL West. I'm Eddie Garcia. We are Fox Sports! iHeartRadio puts the spotlight on Peter Frampton. Born in Beckenham, England, Peter first became interested in music as a seven-year-old, mastering the guitar by age 10 and playing in a band called The Little Ravens, which played on the same bill at school as George and the Dragons, a group including David Bowie. By 16, Peter had been recruited to be the lead guitarist and singer in The Herd, scoring a handful of British teeny bopper hits. Peter was named the face of 1968 by the UK press. He was well on his way. By 1969, 19-year-old Peter formed Humble Pie with ex-small faces singer and guitarist Steve Marriott. Five albums later, he left Humble Pie to go solo in 1971, just in time to see Rock and the Fillmore chase up the U.S. charts. Without regret, he spent the next five years writing, recording, and touring, as well as guesting on other artists' records. Signed to a and he began to build a solid fan base with his first three albums, Wind of Change in 1971, Frampton's Camel in 73, and Something's Happening in 74. In 1975, the release of Frampton gave the world a taste of what was to come. Keep listening to iHeartRadio for more Peter Frampton and all your favorite artists. Hi, my name is Stanley, and I've been arrested for stealing shoes. I didn't really steal them, but I've been sent to Camp Green Lake anyway. The worst punishment a kid could get. And at Camp Green Lake, we dig holes. Lots of holes. I've only been here a short time, but I think the camp director is up to something. I'm Stanley Yelnats, and I'm covering more than dirt at Camp Green Lake. Explore new worlds. Read my story in the novel Holes by Lewis Sacker. For other great book ideas, visit your local library or log on to literacy.com. AD on the radio. Alrighty then. So a couple of very interesting things happened this past weekend just gone by. With regard to 9-11, and we'll get into those after we roll through what remains of the news in today's eyewitness news, or my witness news, rather, in no way, shape, or form. Fair, certainly not balanced. Funkhauser, what else has been going on in the world? Well, so much stuff. 
So much stuff. Hold so on. much stuff. It's raining. Yes. Uh, a Virginia man succeeded in his Kickstarter campaign to have Kenny Loggins play in his living room. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, guy in Virginia, Kickstarter campaign to have Kenny Loggins play in his living room. It all worked out. I think Loggins says it's going to be an interesting challenge. I don't think he's played a venue that big in years. <laughs> uh, Loggins... <laughs> Loggins has like a very impressive beard. And a couple of years ago, he went on the record saying that having a beard when he first got famous was a giant mistake because <laughs> it meant that he couldn't shave like for the rest of his career. He was like, whenever I'm not being Kenny Loggins, not going out on the Are road, we shining not doing the spotlight anything in public. On Kenny Loggins right now? Is why why not? Let's, let's shine the spotlight on Kenny Loggins of Loggins and Messina. Your Is mama he one don't of the dance? progenitors of... No, I don't think he's one of the progenitors of anything other than beard dye. But... Um, <laughs> Kenny Loggins said that he got famous with a beard in Loggins and Messina, I guess. Your mama don't dance and your daddy don't rock and roll. And then he went on to do all the like the 80s songs, like the Top Gun theme song. Highway to the Danger Zone, I believe that was a Loggins classic. Um, but uh, whenever he's not being Kenny Loggins, whenever he's not on the, on the road, being on tour, going on TV, doing interviews, having appearances, whenever he's not being Kenny Loggins, he shaves his beard off. Because he can't stand having it. He's like uncomfortable, it's scraggly, and Kenny Loggins has a beard, unfortunately, so i got to keep mine, but there you go. Although it's probably got to make it easier for him, not that this has been a problem for about the last 30 years, but it's probably got to make it, or it made it easier for him to hop out of the public eye when he wants to. It's like if you during the height of Kenny Loggins' mania, which I'm reliably informed <laughs> happened in about 1986, um... If he wanted to not be recognized, all he has to do is buzz off the beard and go grocery shopping and do normal people things. Highway yeah. to the laundromat. <laughs> Highway to some guy in Virginia's living room. Go on. <laughs> A&E will air a special on Bill Cosby's Accusers. Yeah, special. Approximately 435 hours long. Go on. I can't remember any of it, though. My DVR didn't record that part. <laughs> Dang it. It's not on demand very, anywhere. Very, very good. Very good. A new study shows smoking marijuana may cause diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. It's legal. Pot smokers everywhere rejoice. Aw. Causes diabetes. And even though that doesn't sound like a big deal, remember, stoners, hacky sack becomes way more difficult once you've had your feet amputated. So, yeah, bear that in mind. <laughs> Go on. Does that pop brownie have sugar in it? <laughs> uh, and Al Alabama may tax pornography to cover a budget shortfall. Yeah. Alabama porn? Yeah, Alabama porn. When I say these politicians deserve a spanking, this is not what I meant. Go on. A study claims the lack of housework is making women overweight. <laughs> let's just let's just break that sentence down and digest the various levels. Is this another on sandwich it, joke? On which it could make... No, no, this is not a joke. But the, let, let's just break this sentence down and, and, and carefully take in all the levels in which it's potentially offensive. <laughs> Kill the music for a second, Funkhauser. A study claims a lack of housework... Is making women overweight. <laughs> yeah. A lack of doing chores is making women fat. Not being in the kitchen is ironically making women portly. This is not according to me. This is nothing that I'm putting forward. This is a new study. This study claims that a lack of housework is making women overweight. Uh, you can read more about it. It's uh, published in this week's issue of Share This With Your Wife and Never Get Laid Again magazine. <laughs> oh, <I'm>... Oops. <sighs> oh, one one, one last finally, piece of news. Researchers say putting an autistic child on a gluten-free diet shows no real benefit. Yeah. Yeah, for a second, like, children with autism were being put on these gluten-free diets. No bread, no pizza, no delicious, delicious gluten. And this was supposed to help with autism. But anyways, yeah, researchers say you can give your kid the pizza. Putting an autistic child on a gluten-free diet shows no benefit. But I think they're also saying that they're going to be sure to wait for Jenny McCarthy to weigh in before they make any firm conclusions. <clears throat> so a guy from Devo got married with a Twin Towers cake and box cutters as party favors. 
straight up bizarre. Jerry Casal from Devo got married this past Friday, just gone by, which was September 11th. The cake was in the shape of the Twin Towers with his face on one building and the brides on the other. The wedding favors were actual box cutters, and the name setting cards had a picture of a box cutter with the couple's names on them. Truly bizarre. You can check out the pictures on the interwebs. As unlikely as it seems, Jerry claims he had nothing to do with this. He told TMZ it was a quote-unquote surprise from one of his friends. He added that they didn't get married on 9-11 on purpose. The date was just a coincidence. Is it, though? Is it? Because, I mean, like, Fridays, right? Not necessarily a popular day to get married on. I guess unless you have a nighttime wedding. Because, like, Fridays, well, it's a work day. People, oh, I'm looking at the pictures now. Yeah. You know what? Old Jerry standing behind the uh, pictures of their 9-11 cake. He does look a little bemused by the whole situation. Maybe that's because he just got married, but he doesn't seem like necessarily he's in on the joke, judging by the pictures. But who the hell knows what the uh, the, the pictures mean? I do actually know this guy. I know Jerry Casal. I know him because, uh, well, back in the day, he was a video director. After he was done being in Devo the first time around, he started directing videos, and he did some really, really, really good videos. He did, he did, what did he do? He did some Soundgarden videos. He did some Silver Chair videos. I think he did a Nine Inch Nails video, and he did a video for my band. Now, my one cause for pause in giving him a complete pass on this and suggesting he's anything less than being totally innocent of being in on the joke is something that he did on the shoot of my video and I'll let you know what that was in just a second tweet us at ADSXC at Funk FM iHeartRadio shines the spotlight on Genesis Members of the school band and the fledgling local rock band, the Anon, formed Genesis in 1967 at Charterhouse Public School, England. Keyboardist Tony Banks and bassist Mike Rutherford teamed up with Peter Gabriel on flute and vocals, Anthony Phillips on guitar, and Chris Stewart on drums. In 1968, they signed to Decca. They recorded their first two singles and the album, From Genesis to Revelations. In 1970, the band came to the attention of Charisma, and with producer John Anthony, they began to work on Trespass, a cult success. Stand up and fight, for you know we are right. We must strike at the lies that will spread like disease. Keep listening to iHeartRadio for more Genesis and all your favorite artists iHeartRadio goes one-on-one with Bob Seger to discuss his favorite process for developing new songs. The way I do it, I, I, I sing into an ADAT machine, which is about 40 minutes. I might fill up two or three of them. Then I just go away, come back the next day, and listen to what I did. If there's nothing there, I start again. But I might hear one chord change. I might hear one thing I mumbled lyrically and say, oh, oh, I never even caught that when I did it. You know, it's like just totally a free-form thing almost a jazz thing and sooner or later you know a, 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 a structure of a chord structure or a a phrase or the way I sang something something jumps out of me and it becomes the germ for a song you know and that's really fun keep listening to iHeartRadio for more Bob Seger and all your favorite artists no Someone who everybody wants to punch in the face. A.D. on the radio. So yeah, Jerry Casal from Devo got married this past Friday, just gone by, which was September 11th, and the cake was in the shape of the Twin Towers, with his face on one building and the brides on the other. The wedding favors were actual box cutters, and the table setting cards had a picture of box cutters with a couple's names on them. Now, it, it seems like something that is in spectacularly poor taste, and it is, but as unlikely as it seems, old Jer said he had nothing to do with this. He said it was a surprise from one of his friends, and saying uh, he also said they didn't get married on 9-11. 
11 on purpose. The date was just a coincidence, which seems hinky to me just because to get married on a Friday, don't people usually get married on Saturdays or Sundays? So you can, you know, you can have people not come straight from work. You can have a, a day made of it. It's not that big a deal. Maybe they didn't want to impede on people's weekends. Maybe they wanted a quick thing. All right, come in after work Friday. It'll start the weekend. We'll get married. Oh, look, 911 cake and box cutters. Hmm. Now, if you look at the pictures, old Jerry looks a little nonplussed by the situation. It doesn't necessarily look as though he was in on the joke, which leads me to believe that it was a surprise from one of his friends. And he's kind of an out there guy. Devo, kind of an out there band. And I know from experience what an out there guy he is because, well, know the guy. He directed a whole bunch of videos back in the day. He was a great, great video director after Devo was done doing their first go around. They've since had many resurgences in their career. But after he finished up the first round of Devo, he became a video director. He did videos for bands like Soundgarden and Nine Inch Nails and Silverchair. And he did one for my band, which I, I got to go out on a limb and say was not his best work. It wasn't bad, but it just didn't. I don't know. We weren't thrilled with it. I don't know if he was thrilled with it in the end, but that's beside the point. The thing that makes me know that it was kind of a weird thing, kind of a weird thing that we were dealing with in Uncle Jerry Casal, who was, by the way, one of the nicest human beings on the face of the earth, like really, really stellarly friendly, nice guy, very warm individual. You definitely get a good vibe off of him. So even if he did have something to do with the box cutter, and the 911 cake, the Twin Tower cake that was at his wedding, even if he did have something to do with it, I'm going to guess it was some sort of bizarre performance art, which in his Devo-esque mind seemed to make sense at the time. He didn't necessarily feel like it was going to hurt anyone. And if that's the case, it was, of course, wildly insensitive. I mean, whoever did it, that was wildly insensitive. But here's the thing that made me think uh, dealing with Jerry was not like dealing with other people. In the video that we made with him, he was like, okay, um, I want to have this big, imposing, sort of thuggish-looking guy in your video who's menacing people with a dildo. I was like, oh, I'm going through the lyric sheet. I was like, you know, I don't see anything about that. Don't, don't, don't see anything uh, about, uh, yeah, no, wh wh where's that coming from, Jerry? And um, he was like, well, it's not, we can put a dot matrix over, over the dildo in, in the video. And uh, it's just, I want it to elicit a certain sense from the people around him that are being shot in the video. They won't know it's coming. They'll just be like, oh my God, is that, is that a dildo? That's very strange. Is that a marital aid? And yeah, uh, apparently, um, <clears throat> apparently he's kind of a high concept artsy guy because he went ahead and did that. Even though we said, no, 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 no dildo. And he was like, it'll be dot matrixed out. You won't see it. You can clearly see what it is in the video. And so now when uh, people do their due diligence and look up the uh, the video online and go like, hey, your band was really cool. Why is there a large brutish guy menacing a dude with a uh, menacing people with a sex toy in it? I go, mm, I don't have a good answer for that. I really I really don't. The, and they're like, it's not from your twisted mind. I was like, no, it's really not. But years later, years and years later. Not having, uh, not putting my, my foot down when it came to ar artistic control of my image has caused me to have long and protracted conversations about how I don't feel like it's a good idea for large brutish guys to menace other people with a dildo based on a video that Jerry Casal made for my band like 15 years ago. So <clears throat> there you go. There's my story about Jerry Casal from Devo and why I think he's a little bit out there and why that 9-11 cake might be his doing, but I don't necessarily think if it was his doing, he meant any harm by it. He's just disconnected from the version of reality that you and I experience on a daily basis. Adrian Gr Grenier, Gr is that how you pronounce his name, Funkhauser Grenier? Yeah. The guy from Entourage. Did you ever watch Entourage? You know, I tried to, I tried to get behind it, but me, you know. Yeah. I heard the movie was really good. I heard it was, wait, are you being sarcastic? Because I heard it was spectacularly bad and, and crashed and burned. Wait, which, of, which is it? There was a lot of porn stars in there. Oh. Yeah, so it was good well, there. That was good. So in your other job, when you work with porn stars who were in the movie, they said it was good? Yeah, I didn't see it. <laughs> everybody told me, well, not everybody, but lots and lots of people told me that I should watch it. Watch it. They're like, you would love Entourage. Oh, man, you would love it. It's the greatest show. And... Just the type of people that were telling me I should watch Entourage, the, the biggest, most unmitigated D-bags, unashamed, unmitigated D-bags that I knew. Guys with sparkly shirts and fake tan and 
haircuts that made the back of their head look like roast beef. All these guys were telling me like, oh, bro, dude, dude, bro, 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 you got to watch Entourage. You'll love it, dude, bro. And I was like, "Mm, therein lies the rub. It's coming from you, and I'm not going to watch it. Not that I dislike you. I just find the parts of you that would suggest movies and television shows to be objectionable, so I'm going to leave that the hell out of my watch list. And I think I saw a teeny tiny moment of it once, and I was like, yeah, not, probably not for me. But uh, Entourage star Adrian Grenier, Gr- Grenier, <laughs> however the hell you pronounce his French-sounding last name, um, got into trouble with an Instagram post on September 11th. It was an image of the Twin Towers. With a message, RIP to the 2,996 Americans who died on 9-11, RIP to the 1,455,590 innocent Iraqis who died during the U.S. invasion for something they didn't do. After getting some serious, serious backlash, he deleted it and replaced it with a less controversial post like a painting of firefighters raising a flag at ground zero and a pause sign that's supposed to look like the World Trade Center. Here's the thing about being an actor, especially an actor in something like Entourage. People need context for this sort of thing. If you want to go out, if you want to go out and say something like, I feel bad about the Americans who died in 9-11. I also feel bad about the innocent Iraqis who died in the ensuing in U.S. invasion. First and foremost, you got to provide context. You got to be able to put people in a safe place before you put forth an opinion like that. Second of all, they have to respect the source from which it comes. And rightly or wrongly, Adrian Grenier, and I'm going to, Grenier, I'm going to guess rightly. People view you as an actor. What are actors? They are empty vessels. They are paint to splash on a canvas uh, from people that have the talent and gumption to write and create something. So it's just, I get what he was trying to do. I understand it. I vaguely sympathize because human cost isn't just limited to America. But yeah, let's have some context. Know who the hell you are and what the hell people are going to think. Sounds good coming out of your mouth, whether it be digitally or otherwise. Spectacularly large lapse in judgment on his part. And that's what you would expect from an actor. Like I said, actors, just generally speaking, empty vessels that shouldn't be allowed to think, tweet, or speak for themselves. Unless it comes from a script, mm, shuddy. What else? What else is going on in the world? Oh. <laughs> uh, you tell me. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, this is a good one. This is probably my favorite bit of news today. Funkhauser, do you remember the first time you ever heard the F word other- uttered? Uh, hmm. I don't remember. Mm. I, do, I remember... Yes. Um, I remember being about, I remember being about four years old and a neighbor kid, Brian Crosby, who was just a, he was like the block bully. He was just no good. They're, they're like, he's one of those guys where if I found out that he was living alone in a trailer, losing all his teeth with him falling out of his head after having developed a meth habit, I would A, be unsurprised, B, be kind of stoked about it because he was a neighborhood bully and he used to beat the crap out of me and the crap out of everybody else on the block. And um, I, uh, I remember being about four years old and hearing him. I remember being about four years old and hearing him describe me and a couple other kids on the block as effing a-holes. And I was like, hmm, hmm, yeah, I don't know what that means, but it sounds not good. And I went home and I told my mom and she was like, what? And I think I mispronounced it. I think I was like, he called us a bunch of effing axles. And she was like, axles? But, hmm, oh, yeah, no, not good. Let, let, me, let me explain something about, uh, you know how you think that that kid, Brian Crosby, is a terrible human being? And I was like, well, yeah. And she's like, him using that those words in public pretty much means he's a terrible human being. So we, we don't associate with him. And when he says those words to us, what do we do? We ignore him. Uh, by the way, ignoring a bully, <laughs> unless you can really, really run when they get so mad that you're not being provoked by them, not necessarily the best plan of attack, but I appreciate where my mom was coming from on that one you ignore him be like your words have no effect on me i'm just going to go on continuing my life coloring in the sidewalk with chalk you know what a bully will do when you ignore him because they want to get your attention and you're coloring in the sidewalk with chalk they'll step on your hands and punch you in the head that happened to me (laughs) Uh, i got my comeuppance with him though right after he uh, punched me in the head after stepping on my hand while i was doing the chalk thing 
what he failed to notice was the the toy fire truck um, <laughs> that was sitting next to me, which I then proceeded to whip at his head, and uh, he left me alone after that. One gaping wound later, and the bully was dealt with. I'm not saying it's the best method for dealing with bullies, but in my case, in that particular instance, it made the Brian Crosbys of my world go away. But anyways, your earliest recollection of the F word? <laughs> Get this. A medieval researcher said he's found the earliest written example of the F word. So two things. One, this story will involve the phrase F or F word. Two, it'll totally be worth it. Dr. Paul Booth is an honor, honorary senior research fellow at Keele University in England. And recently he was going through some medieval legal documents, specifically the Chester County court plea rolls from December 8th in the year 1310 goes all the way back to 1310. It was so cool that they had the presence of mind to document this stuff. Anyways, in the notes written by the court clerk, he found three examples of an interesting name. <laughs> Roger F. by the Naval. Yep, Roger F. by the Naval. Or, <laughs> if you put it in more current terms... Wait, F? Ro to, like past ro tense? Uh, no, no, just uh, not as a verb. Just Roger F. by the Naval. And if you put it in more current terms, Funkhauser, it means Roger, the guy who tried to have belly button sex. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, the researcher, Dr. Booth, says it probably wasn't the guy's real last name, but a derogatory nickname. But that was how people referred to him. In other words, the clerk didn't put it in the notes as a joke. He said, quote, I suggest it could either mean an actual attempt at copulation by an inexperienced youth later reported by a rejected girlfriend, or an equivalent of the word dimwit, i.e. a man who might think that was the correct way to go about it. Meaning, he either got tarred with a nickname after <laughs> after having an ex inexperienced grope with a female where he, uh, he went after not only the wrong orifice, but something that wasn't actually an orifice. <laughs> and, was, uh, and then the girl ran and told the entire town. Or... It meant that he was so stupid, he was so idiotic that he might think that was the correct way to copulate. In either, in either case, I love this. This is so effing awesome. As Dr. Booth puts it, it's quote unquote, 14th century revenge porn. <laughs> Roger F. by the Naval was accused of a serious criminal charge, but it's not clear what it was. And he was eventually kicked out of the country. Aww. Poor Roger F. by the Naval. <laughs> Better luck next time. Thank you so much for hanging out, being part of our radio family. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll do it all over again. Tweet us at ADSXE at Funk FM.